that wasn't too bad, right? That was that was a pretty quick turnover. I got the the title done, the thumbnail done, the description done, posted on Twitter, uh, put out the links. Jeez, and and a bunch of people are here. So you know what? You guys were right. We did it. Um, Stephen Fiorillo, the great Stephen Fiorillo, Tevis, the great Tevis. The, the Tevis I'm not allowed to say the last name of, unfortunately. Um, let's talk about some PayPal. Who's buying? I'm buying. Tevis? And I want to be buying so bad. I just, I'm not, I don't have a lot of money at my disposal right now. But I'll probably be buying uh, over the next couple of weeks for sure. Do you have a position right now? Uh, only leads. Okay. Okay. All I got. Steven. You yeah. just recently wrote an article on PayPal. Yes. Why you? Why do you have a strong buy on this stock? So, originally, I wanted to start a position in it when it was around sixty-four ish, and I ended up missing it. And then it came down after earnings, and the valuation is so freaking low. I started a position. I'm scaling my way in. Right. And I have made three purchases so far. And I plan on continuing to purchase shares until 65, 66. Right. That area. But I'm going to say the same thing I said to you. I don't know if it was live or not, but PayPal could be the most undervalued stock I've seen in a very long time. So, okay, so hold on. Is 65, 66 the upper threshold where you don't want to buy any share above that price? No. Uh, to be honest like what, with what you, is, I think what 75 is, is a good deal. I think 75 is a good deal at this point. Like this would, thing is so it. undervalued. It's just, I'm looking at this the way I'm looking at SL Green. I have a pretty big position in SL Green. And I started buying SL Green last winter around 38 bought it all the way down to 20 and i bought shares uh a couple weeks ago at 31 ish so i just have an idea in my head of like based on what i've already purchased and the amount of shares i want to get to what price point i want to be at so when i start writing cover calls on half my position It'll just work out the way that I want it to work out. To, but that's my own personal thing. Like I personally do believe, my own opinion, this thing could be a coiled spring, and that's why I said this could have a meta-like moment. Yeah, yeah. So, like, obviously, whenever people are talking about PayPal, probably the biggest thing is the increased competition. I, I will probably um, take more of a. Uh, devil's advocate approach to whatever side so just in case if tevis wants to be um bullish or bearish on that side let, let i want some counter argument here so there's a ton of competition for paypal um does that not sort of kill it for you whenever the valuation is so um you know sort of drawn down Stephen, the only reason that, the only way it would kill it for me is if they stop growing revenue and revenue started declining and if they weren't generating nearly the amount of profits that they were generating, then I would get worried. But sure. e look, even if this company doesn't grow top line revenue anymore, but they keep the current margins, the company's still a steal, in my opinion. Like they're so freaking profitable, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So the thing that I'm worried about and where a lot of my commentary in previous pods was going around my concern around the value trap is that when you start to see the growth metrics turning, so the top line growth, the free cash flow, all that stuff. And when you start to see them going in the wrong direction, it's already too late because the market is so forward looking. Take it, take that off. Let me show something else first. Okay. Let me blow a hole in that thesis. And I'm not saying that this is foolproof and I'm not saying that PayPal can't Please. go down because it can go down. There's no question about that. Let's be very clear. Do not follow me into this because I'm buying. I am not that smart and I could be 100% freaking wrong. And competition could eat PayPal 
completely out, no question. But I don't think that's going to happen, and here's why. So in the article that I wrote, I want to go directly to the analysts. Just and make sure you is, zoom it. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is the important thing here because these are not my numbers, not Tevis's, not Tanner's, Wall Street analysts. You got 43 analysts saying that PayPal is going to come in with $4.95 of EPS this year. Next year, $5.66, another 43 analysts. Then you have 22 analysts saying 637 in 2025. I believe in 2022, you can fact check me. I think it was like 270 a share. We can check that soon. It was somewhere in the mid to high twos, I believe. You're seeing real big growth. And I care about profitability. And you don't have to, at PayPal's stage, you don't have to have huge top line growth to generate huge earnings growth because they're generating so much free cash flow. And let's bring up the buyback slide because that's very important also because they can manufacture earnings same way apple manufactures earnings as long as free cash flow continues to come in where it comes in and they continue buying back shares this is a company that can take the company private in 13 or 14 years based on their free cash flow so yeah. every time they do a buyback and revenue stays the same and margins stay the same, earnings increase. Yeah. Right. So I, I want to capture it because I know, Stephen, like I didn't have the chance to read your full article yet, um, but I, I was taking a look earlier today and I, I want to capture it in, in sort of phases. You know, I think B-Dubs brings up a, a good point here um, on, on the counter side saying PayPal is not going to have a meta moment. Uh, they can't monetize Venmo. Can we talk about that? for a second, because I know that, I mean, Tanner on, on your side, like one of your biggest bull cases is the growth and the popularity that Venmo is having with younger demographics that, you know, along with Braintree, which we can touch on in, in, in a second, but the core PayPal brand, their flagship, you know, um, logo is sort of, it's not, it's not growing, right? Their, their main growth driver is Venmo. So if they can't monetize it, then that's going to be a big problem down the line. Let's just talk about that for a sec. The, can, can I can I speak on that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, their main growth driver is Braintree right now, at least. Uh, Venmo is doing all right. Um, but, for example, they released one product that took their average revenue per user from $20 to $35. A single new product. It was Venmo Crypto. Um, and... And so now they're getting into new products like Venmo Commerce. They're getting into teen accounts. Um, it, it absolutely is is monetizable, and I think it'll be from the same way for what you're seeing with every other you know multifaceted uh, digital wallet. They they can come out with equities. They can come out with crypto. They can come out with all of these things. They've expressed interest in wanting to get into equities. So who's to say that this can't be? Um, you know, a future Robin Hood and build into equities trading, but with already the back end of 80 million users. Yeah, but the, the, the counter I would have there is that because the barrier to entry is so low, there's really no stickiness from a, a customer loyalty perspective, right? Because like I can go to Venmo, I can very, just as easily switch to Cash App. The moment that the competitor offers me a fractional, um, you know, uh, reward on top and the reason why is because i don't have any skin in the game i don't have any sunk cost in terms of like how hard it was to do this process for example like you know if i'm transferring banks i have to think twice about it because it's weeks long process it's my entire life that i'm moving i might have a mortgage i might have you know whatever but moving from cash app to venmo or back and forth it's it's nothing to me i can have both apps on my phone at the same time so you know i Maybe, maybe just let's touch on that. Yeah, so so uh, there was a product that came out in Canada called Wealth Simple Cash. Um, it was trying to be the cash app of Canada, but it never did take off and all the plans were kind of canceled. Um, why did that happen? Why did it not take off? Interact is free. I mean, sure. That's but why. It's, 
But it's also because your friends didn't have it. Yeah, right? because Interact is free. Like, it doesn't matter. I can just send through any bank I want, free, and, like... Yeah, I don't know. It, I don't. I don't think it's nearly as uh, as good. And I think uh, Interact has a lot of flaws, but that's going to get very Canadian technical. Um, but I, what all I was trying to express was uh, that the stickiness that Venmo versus Cash App people have is that their network of friends have that as well. You can't switch between them because your money is all at one, and so is your network of friends that all have that app as well. So maybe this is just a clarifying point. If I'm on Venmo, I can't send to somebody who's on Cash App. Uh, well, you can through other things like like they'll have uh, connected external transfers that will take three to five days. But if you want that instant transfer, you need to have Cash App exclusive or Venmo exclusive and, users. And they both hook into my bank account, right? So I have one bank account. And then from that bank account, my Cash App can pull from it and my Venmo can pull from it. And I can have both apps on my phone. And then it just becomes a game of... Who has the bigger network in the U.S., let's say? Well, they, they don't really want to take from your bank account. They want to store the currency themselves. Um, so the actual transfer from your bank takes some time. Uh, but similarly with, with SoFi and such, they will do things like they will lend you that money so then you can use it, but then they will end up giving you that money, like the, the two-day early paycheck, if you know what that is. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I do think that there's more to the stickiness on these accounts. That's why you're still seeing a ton of like volume growth and, and stuff like this. But um, yeah, no Interact in, in America, which is just essentially Zell. That's all it is. But, yeah. And it's way less great and there's no online uh, usability. It's just integrations only. You're going to have so, to blow that up. Is, uh, it, yeah. yeah. So look, from a risk standpoint this is the balance sheet from q2 there's this is not a leveraged company so where my mouse is you have 5.5 billion in cash on hand and another 4.4 billion in short-term investments short-term investments are normally investments that can be liquidated 30 days or so long term is a year or over so you have 9.8 billion in on-hand liquidity with another $4.5 billion in long-term investments on the balance sheet. PayPal's debt is $10.55 billion. They can pay off 85 to 95%, 85 to 90% of the debt right now from their on-hand liquidity and have a hundred percent of their debt obligations paid if they liquidate their long-term investments and still have several billion dollars on hand. This is a golden goose of a balance sheet because there is zero leverage because of the cash ratio to debt. The debt is completely covered and most of it on hand. When you look at it from that side, it really deleverages the risk aspect for the company. And then you look at the profitability that they have. 66 billion market cap is crazy for this company. I mean, we start looking into, let me go to the slides that I prepared specifically for Tana. Thank you. Thank you. Is this comparisons to other large businesses? Uh, I, I did everything for you specifically. <laughs> So we'll do the numbers first, and I'll do the actual charts that are for you. Okay, zoom, zoom, zoom. Yes, I'm working on that. Perfect. Perfect. Wow, right. that's amazing. All right, so I looked at two things, the price to free cash flow, and then the forward earnings for 2023, 24, and 25. We'll start with the price to free cash flow. And I did PayPal twice and NVIDIA twice because there was such a huge disparity on the trailing 12 and what the future prediction is. So maybe Stephen, you can just, uh, I, I know you've talked about why you use price to free cash flow in the past, yep. but just for new people watching, just a super primer on like why that's the thing. Yeah. So free cash flow is my favorite measure of profitability because it is simply cash in versus cash out. It's very hard to manipulate that number. 
net income can be manipulated due to write downs, write off, what you're paying in taxes, stock based compensation, expenses, unusual items. Um, there's a ton of lines that go into it to come up with a gap profitability measure of net income, whereas free cash flow is the pool of capital that you buy back shares from, you pay a dividend from, you repay debt from, you make acquisitions from. So that's why I like using free cash flow. So look at it from the lens of you are a private citizen, you're going to go buy a business. You're going to go buy a small business. You're going to buy a pizzeria. You're going to buy a laundromat. You're going to buy some type of asset, income producing asset. One of the first questions you're going to ask is how long until I get my money back? So if you're going to pay, let's say 500 grand for a pizzeria, but it's going to take you 25 years to make your initial 500 grand back, you may not think it's that great of an idea. But if it's going to take 10 years or 15 years, it may be a different story on top of paying yourself a salary. So I look at the price to free cash flow from two things. One, how is the company trading versus it peers? And two, if you were to buy the whole company, how long would it take for you to pay yourself back from the profits? PayPal, with its TTM, trades at 18.4 times its free cash flow, which is yeah. lower than any of these other companies. And we have Alpha, I'm not going to read them off. And then on their forward, because they said they're going to generate $5 billion in free cash flow this year, they're trading at 13.44 times free cash flow. So now I put tech companies, but I also put consumer staples because they're boring. So you're telling me that PayPal should be trading at a lower multiple than Coca-Cola or Pepsi? I mean, what's exciting about Coke or Pepsi? Yes, they're exciting to me because they're dividend. They create stable earnings. They're both dividend kings, 50 and 60 years of dividend increases. But Pepsi trades at 43 times its free cash flow. And their free cash flow is $5.7 billion. Not that much more than what PayPal is going to produce this year. And PayPal is trading at a quarter of the valuation. Yeah. It, it is crazy. So then I look at the proprietary slides for Tanner. Because I know he likes things. stuff that's not on Seeking Alpha. So... I put the price to free cash flow at a grid. Before we go into this, I forgot. Let's do the EPS. So I looked that EPS chart that I showed with all the analysts. I did that for all the same companies. And I did the 2023 forward, 24 and 2025 forward. Right now you're paying 12 and a half times earnings for PayPal's 2023 numbers. Almost 11 times on 2024 and high single digit 9.6 times earnings for 2025. None of these companies are trading anywhere near that. PayPal's trading like it's going out of freaking business. Not going out of business, but it's suffering a serious decline. So you start looking at that on a chart. I mean, it starts to look really freaking interesting real quick when you start looking at PayPal at 12 point. Three, six versus these other companies on our forward PE. And then times next year's earnings, I mean, PayPal is trading like 3M. I know 3M because I just did an article on our trade. 3M is at like 12 times next year's earnings. Like you're telling me that PayPal shouldn't be trading in this low 20 multiple? I mean, low 20s used to be nothing to get crazy about. Do you have anything that uh, overlays the growth rate? Because like I get it from a val from a value perspective, it's cheap. But how does this compare to the growth that some of these other companies on this comparison have? Right now. Yeah, let's do it right now. I also don't think it is a growth play. However, I do, I do think that it does benefit from some. Uh, benefits just like the market like you know cash displacement is allowing um you know paypal to still grow uh but i don't think people are thinking that they're a market share gainer in digital wallets for example but i do think that the time it'll take for them to be extinct will be enough time for them to buy back their entire like every single uh share that is outstanding and that is crazy if if, if for example the price stays this low yeah, so PayPal is going to see 
from the end of 2023 to the end of 2025, which keep in mind, they're pretty much doubling their EPS this year. So that's not even accounted for in this. Just the end of 2023 to the end of 2025, they're going to grow their earnings by almost 29%. Coke is growing their earnings by 14, 15%, and Pepsi by 16%. I mean, even big tech companies, Apple's growing at less than 20%. Um, Microsoft, 33%. I mean, it's not super low growth. And then if we put in this year's earning, I'm, glad, I'm sorry, 2022's earnings, this is going to look crazy. Yeah. So no. there is growth here. All while buying up shares. Reducing yes. the amount of outstanding shares, which means that it's it's like artificially increasing their growth rates, right? Plus, the other thing is like, you know, now with PayPal, the added factor that you didn't have a month ago or two months ago is you're buying a call option on this new leadership, which that can slice both ways if you're bullish on it or bearish on it. But that, you know, the, the um, what's his name? Alex Chris is going to have something to prove in terms of stepping into Shulman's shoes um, over the first couple of months, the first couple of quarters in PayPal, like he is expected to on these earnings calls on these press releases, deliver a vision for, you know, what does PayPal's future look like, you know, not only over the next 24 to 36 months, but what does it look like longer term than that? And let's go down a rabbit hole. PayPal could be a great acquisition target for a lot of companies because what do you get when you buy PayPal? You get huge free cash flow. You get what call it 18, 17 or 18 percent of the current market cap in cash on hand. You get a ton of users, a great brand. Let's think about the co companies. Google and Apple, I am shocked neither have purchased PayPal because it fits perfectly in Google Pay and Apple Pay. Visa, MasterCard would be a home run for one of those companies. I mean, this is a deal that at the current valuation pays for itself. I mean, this is not some stupid tie-in acquisition. You got to do all these different things. This is a bolt-on, huge free cash flow machine, highly profitable, large revenue, huge user base, transaction volume, great margins. I mean... I would not be surprised if this company gets acquired, not saying it's going to, but it's a good fit for a larger company to come in and purchase them. I think um, there is like, uh, I don't know about acquisition targets, but uh, there are a large amount of funds that are starting to pick up PayPal right now as well, while the uh, investments are low. So people are looking at this as being a, a, uh, a, a low price for some to actually think that this is now a deal. I do think that this is a, a sort of an inflection point right now, whether it's going to be a make or break. And, and the CEO could be a big part of that. But I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm. Uh, this could go, look, this can go way, lower. But, there's, no question, there's no question that this can go lower. Okay. The problem right now is you're paying the same price that you did in 2017 before all the growth, like you're back to 2017 levels. So now you're paying for a mature company that's widely profitable, that's buying back shares hand over fist. And from a valuation standpoint, they're trading like they're Altria. Like that's crazy. That's crazy. This is a tech company. It, it, and But that's what I think people are really missing. Like Braintree is still growing like crazy. They, they just passed the total payment volume of Adyen. Um, Alex Chris literally specializes in small to medium-sized businesses and self-employed uh, divisions for Intuit, right? That's where he's been his entire career. He's coming over to PayPal. Braintree is their, their biggest grow, uh, growth aspects right now, and that's exactly where he's going to lie. You know what I mean? I, I think it's the perfect the perfect person to put in the uh, in the captain's chair right now, and 
And I, I'm still a believer that we're going more into digital payments and more into global payments. I think, uh, I don't know. I, I do think that there will be bigger market share winners than PayPal. I don't think that they're this revolutionary company. But at this price, I think people are pricing it for death when it should just be priced for slow growth. So, so Tanner, you think that um, given Alex Chris's background, he's going to put his chips behind the B2B side of PayPal as opposed to the B2C side? Correct. Like, yeah. Is that like Braintree over Venmo type of deal? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that... Uh, that PayPal will be focusing on the platform side of the business, which is where like AdDN is focused, servicing the Shopify's, the WooCommerce, the all the companies and their checkout processes, right? It's probably the better move. It's the more sustainable revenue source. It's the only way, like with, with things like FedNow and all these things sort of uh, picking apart some of the areas of like peer-to-peer, -peer, um, PayPal can't really focus too much on the digital-only side because you don't know how much money people are going to keep on that platform. Right. Um, and so, but where no one is sort of trying to take away is the checkout side. If, if you can increase the, the level of conversions on, on a certain, uh, like for example, Shopify or, uh, WooCommerce or Wix or something like this, I want to, I want to use Wix as an example rather than Shopify because Shopify has their own competitor. But if you can offer Wix a better solution, say, Hey, we have a one page checkout that whenever our customers use this, there's a 15% higher chance that they will actually convert into a buying user, okay? That is absolutely worth a large investment if you're going to convert 15% higher conversions across their entire platform. And that's what Braintree is actually delivering on right now, right? They just need more partners. And they're even uh, expecting to turn 25 more partners on uh, between now and the end of the year. 25 large platform partners. Over well, and two. think about what you said, Tevis. What's this guy's background? Okay. Think about the synergies when he opens up his Rolodex and starts making phone calls. I mean, there is a lot of connections that he can tap to start really front loading that growth again. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, he comes with a, a track record from Intuit. He also comes with a network from Intuit yes. as well, which I don't think a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, no, it's something that people don't realize. He has a huge network. He's going to take PayPal in the direction that Tanner said. He's going to open up the Rolodex. He's going to make the personal phone calls and he's going to get the job done. So are there any natural synergies between Intuit and PayPal in terms of collaboration? Because I know Intuit is what, like double the market cap that PayPal is at this point? I mean, yeah, like being the payment processor um, for QuickBooks and, and these sorts of things. But I mean, aside from that, I don't know. I don't follow Intuit close enough. And you got to remember, if he's liked and if he still maintains those connections, which you have to believe he is and he will, Think about the amount of companies that Intuit does business with that can recommend utilizing PayPal for something. Like there's just there's a lot of unknowns that could be very big potential winners for PayPal down the road. And this is look from a financial standpoint, this is a deal that just makes sense at this level. If it was 150 or 200 a share, I wouldn't be buying. Like, I would not be calling this a deep value play right now. Like, this is a deep value play based on the numbers. And it, it's hard to really look at this and not get excited only because the company is so profitable and they're buying back so many shares. Right. So, so okay. We talked a little bit about Venmo. We talked about Braintree. We talked about, you know, the balance sheet of PayPal and the buybacks. Um, Stephen, in your article, you mentioned, I mean, the entire headline was, was the meta moment and I, it's going to be a little bit of a spiked question, but what is your internal range for, for when that happens? And the reason why I say it's spiked is because it also depends a lot on macro, but I think we have a, I mean, with Jackson hole as well today, I think we have a fair landscape, um, today of what's, what we can expect over the next four quarters, roughly on the macro. So I'm just curious, like 
for that meta moment for PayPal, like when do you think that's going to happen? So PayPal topped out around like 312 or 318, something like that. Let me ask you a question before I answer yours. If you saw PayPal shares at $110, would you think that's a crazy? No. I think okay, they can go from 60 to 120 fairly easily. And, and here's why I say the question. Because... People remember this stock in the 100 to 200 range. People remember this stock in the 200 to 300 range. This is a market psychology where if it was trading at 110, people wouldn't bat an eye because they remember it being much higher. And it's not even half of where it was. So the meta moment, look, JP Morgan just increased their price target from 90 to $100. That's another thing. To me, the meta moment's doubling. I'm not going to get crazy and say 180 or 220. Like, meta went up from 89 to 3, what was like 325 or something like that, and then it retraced after earnings. And that took a year, year and a half to happen, ever since the Brad Gershner letter, maybe just less than a year. So, I don't know. I think, I think PayPal can hit 100 by next March. After the next two quarters, maybe it takes two or three quarters, but I don't think it's crazy. I think this is going to go back to 100 because even at 100, it's nowhere near closing the gap from what Meta did. And similar situation for different reasons, they fell off, but very similar situation with when they peaked and when they dropped. I mean, PayPal freaking dropped all the way up here. And they never retraced back up. I Yet wanted, they kept growing. I wanted to point out as well, because whenever just looking uh, at the stock price, it doesn't just show off the, you know, the market cap as well. Um, you know, whenever looking at competitors like Cash App and everything, you should compare these companies also in terms of stock-based compensation and total outstanding shares. And that's one thing where I get really, really excited. I know that we talked about that they buy back um, shares, but like visualize it, right? Um, I just have this in a snipping tool just because it was easier to look at this than all the ads around it. But now I'm realizing, okay, there we go. Um, so just going from 2014 to about, you know, 2017 roughly, it was quite flat. And then as time went on, then we just started buying shares. Now things are starting to get really cheap and the, and it's just the shares are falling off of uh, off of a cliff. So um, I didn't highlight that, but now we are only at uh, 1.1 1 .1 billion shares outstanding for PayPal, which is leading to that 60 plus billion dollar mark cap. If we can continue to take off $5 billion worth of shares at this value uh, per year, and that's assuming that doesn't increase, right? We, we've even increased it this year because we were able to sell uh, a part of our buy now, pay later book. PayPal is just going to continue to take off more and more shares like at, at such a high clip. Like look at that as a dividend. And you're talking about like an eight to 10% dividend right now. It's the most efficient way of returning capital to shareholders. And the big thing about buybacks is PayPal is buying $2 billion worth of shares from now until the end of the year, over the next two quarters. They're going to reduce the an average price of 65. They'll reduce the float by 2.8%. From, from this time till the end of the year? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's your dividend right there. It's huge. And how about this? If PayPal continues to allocate $3 billion toward buybacks annually for the next five years, $15 billion, which will reduce the float by 14% if the average price they pay is $100. Mm. Think about that. At $100 over the next five years, they can reduce the float by 14% at $3 billion a year. I yeah. mean, did... This is a company, <laughs> if shares of PayPal continue to stay at this valuation, while PayPal generates this level of profitability and allocates this level to buybacks, they'll buy back every share over the next 15 to 20 years. Yeah. 
I mean, every show they don't they don't even need to, right? Because like I think I think you nailed it um, earlier when you said on the market psychology, it cuts both ways, right? When the stock has fallen from three hundred down to sixty, people are going to think, oh, it still has room to fall to thirty. But when it goes from sixty to a hundred. People are going to say, oh, it still has room to go from 100 to 150 because it's still like way off its yeah. highs. I mean, the stock market is the only place that people hate sales. It's crazy. You go to a department store, you go to a restaurant, you go to a grocery store. You're not going to complain paying $25 for something that normally retails at 50. Yet, if a stock goes down, people start to run for the hills and work like Altria. I'm buying more. It is so crazy cheap. They just increase. So think about this. Altria Group has increased its dividend for 54 consecutive years. They have done 58 dividend increases over those 54 years. They just increased the dividend last week by 4.3%. The dividend is now at 8.97%. And Altria Group or whatever is a, is a, a cigarette, cigarette company, just so yeah. everyone's. And their plan out to 2028 is that they're going to grow the dividend annually in the low, in the mid single digits. Hmm. This is a company that is also going to grow earnings every year sequentially and generates eight and a half billion in free cash flow. Market caps like 70 billion. No, I, I think that's wrong. It, they're trading at um, high single-digit earnings. Sometimes the market gets things wrong. The company's gone down 26% over the past five years, but their earnings, their revenue, and their dividend continues to grow. Sometimes when things go on sale, people get freaking worried for no reason. Well, so l let's even, because I, I use that as an example too. Like if we want to look at this as a value stock, uh, like I would with um, uh, Altria, um, that the total addressable market of smokers every single year goes down, right? And then even whenever you look at the other things like e-cigarettes and everything like this, those are still not very compelling in my opinion. It's not a stock that I like personally, but that's fine. That's fine. What I do like about PayPal, however, is that people's idea of this company dying is, uh, you know, the total addressable market growing by 20% and PayPal growing at like 10%. Okay, per year. That's not a dying company. That's a slower grower, but they are, but the, like everything, they have nothing but tailwinds. They, they might not have as big of sales as other companies, but what they do have is a massive market and, and a new CEO that could bring fresh blood and a new way of innovating on this company. If, for mm -hmm. example, like right now, Adyen stock just dropped over 50 plus percent in the main couple reasons was because Braintree right now is outpricing the market so low right now that other companies are not able to compete. And the reason that they're able to do that is because they have 400 plus million users that they can give discounts to the payment processing through PayPal. PayPal think, is by far the biggest player. And think about brand recognition and trust level. So you get somebody like me. I'm not using one of these other companies because PayPal has earned that brand recognition and... I feel more comfortable on a security aspect that my information is not going to get compromised utilizing PayPal. Even if another company has the same level of encryption or whatever it is, I'm familiar with it. I already have an account that I'd have to already reset my password for unless it's saved in my phone or something. But I'm not switching to a different type of thing if I want to use that type of method to pay for something. Yeah. Uh, I think PayPal is actually considered the most trusted brand in all of fintech right now. Yeah, it's the gold standard. It's it, it's the gold standard not only for users but also for governments and people really overlook that as well. Like name me another payment processor that owns their full entire ownership in China right now that is in a Nor that is a North American company. A single one. You won't be able to uh, PayPal has exclusive rights to their company in China, and it's just, it's crazy that they even got that. I mean, I look at it like, how much more can they go down? Yeah, they can go down more, but is it really that realistic considering the fundamentals in their cash position and they're not leveraged? I don't see it going to 40. 
If it does, I'm in a dollar cost average, but I don't see it. I mean, what's the bad news that needs to come out for this thing to go past 55? Like, really think about that. We got to 58 the other day. What's the news that has to happen to go for it to continue to go down? Beautiful question. Yeah. No, but like, if you're going to be bearish on this company, where seriously though, like, yeah, where's like where's the stop? Like, anybody who's been bearish on PayPal has been 100 percent correct. Like, I'm not somebody that. No, but they, are you are you bearish today though? Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, if you were bearish at 200, you've been correct. Mm -hmm. But are you still bearish now? Like, where does it stop? Where does it go past 50? This is a 45 dollar company. Does it go past 45? Go past 40? Like, where's the where's the floor? Because you I mean, want to start talking about going to 30 from here, that puts its market cap around where Square is. And Square generates like 300 million of free cash flow and isn't profitable on a gap level. Yet PayPal is widely profitable. So where, where does the bleeding stop? And does like so much more in stock based compensation and stuff to dilute shareholders rather and than think about buy this. If it goes to 30, do you really think somebody's not buying them? Like at some point, this becomes a no-brainer acquisition for somebody. But, they, but they'd never – like would they even entertain that acquisition offer? If it goes to 30 – let's just say it goes to 30 and somebody comes in to buy the shares at 55, that board has a very serious fiduciary responsibility. I highly consider that offer. Right. I mean, look, the one thing I will say is that – all the points are valid and logical and make sense. And all the numbers are there for like the correct analysis to say, or to have a very strong case. The thing is that the market is incredibly irrational. I mean, we've seen tech stocks from 2021 to now, I mean, they've fallen 80, 85% um, in, in a lot of cases, in some cases, even like 90% in some of the more speculative growth names. So, to say like, oh, well, pay I don't see a catalyst for PayPal falling under 55. I think that like it could fall to 40. It could fall to 30 if the macro keeps falling because it's just the market being irrational. Like there is no price at which I will say, oh, well, it can't go underneath this price because that would assume that everybody in the market is rational, which we know for a fact or not. Yeah, but that's what we but that's what we try to do here every day is. Can, can we find something that the market isn't seeing? You know no, what I mean? I, I agree that there's more upside than there is downside at this level. If you do yeah, enough I mean, due diligence, if you look at this as just PayPal, it does look like things are slowing growth and that the average person, especially younger users, do not make a PayPal account. Um, the problem with that assessment is just assuming that PayPal is just PayPal. PayPal is a whole bunch of things now and they're only growing. I mean, look, yeah. talk about market being irrational. I mean, this is from two weeks ago or three weeks ago in one of my other articles I wrote. I think it was the beginning of August. I mean, talk about being irrational. That is, those are crazy numbers. Like if you, and once again, go back to the business aspect. If you're going to buy a business, okay, and regardless if Shopify has more growth potential or not, because there's a good chance that they do, for the business <laughs> aspect today, are you paying $74 billion for Shopify that loses $2 billion a year? Or are you paying $69 billion for PayPal that's making $4 billion in net income? Yeah. I mean, yeah. talk it, about the market being irrational. I do think that in your articles, though, you should put my name in them somewhere. Because <laughs> you're, you're like comparing them to Shopify, NVIDIA, all, all like... I, I compared it to Shopify because Shopify was another market darling in 2021 in the internet purchasing space while they don't do payment processing, but they, they were in that area. That's why I use them. <clears throat> but, yeah, no, those are, those are my two biggest positions right now is Shopify and NVIDIA. <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, I, I love a good I love a valuation. I mean, look at Snowflake. Snowflake trades a huge multiple. They're free cash flow profitable, but they're not gap profitable. Yeah. Yeah. All PayPal needs is some AI and a partnership with NVIDIA, and they're going to be back to 150 before you know it. So there is there is real bear cases to PayPal. Um, yes. One of them being their uh, transaction margins. Whenever looking 
at how much they make per transaction, it has been continuously going down. However, that being said, um, management has said this will recover in 2023. They've then specified that to say, whenever we meant 2023, we meant Q4 of 2023, obviously, right? So now people are like, okay, well, this is all now tanking the stock even further. And very much like Shopify, they got themselves into a lot of hot water because during COVID, they had guided exponentially, like, like very, very excited, right? Very excited that online shopping has now been seen by the masses and that growth will not turn back to brick and mortar. It did, okay? Um, that killed those two companies at the time. Um, so, I, yeah, like, like I don't know if, if people have faith in PayPal's guidance going forward. So even though they're projecting and saying great things going forward, uh, even about transaction margins doesn't mean that people are taking too kindly to it. Go ahead, Stephen. No, I was bringing it to set you up for it in case you wanted to refer to it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, just at the bottom here, um, on the most left is the latest. That's from, if you can scroll up, that should be, uh, what is that, Q1 of, yeah, Q1 of 2022. And then all the way to the most right is Q2 of 2023, which you can see at 45.9% versus 50.9%. A lot of this, though, is all that... Um, benefits that they're giving to newer uh, companies that are coming on to Braintree. Now, one of the areas, and this is sort of the biggest bear thesis, and, and I'm going to get a little technical, okay? I apologize. But um, there's a lot of uh, problems with payment processors in general in the overall marketplace right now because there's, they're kind of losing their exclusivity and they're, it's kind of becoming a rate game where certain companies like Shopify can work with all three, right? And between ADN, Stripe, and Braintree and individually choose at the time which one has the lowest rate and then flow their volume through that system, okay? So you're only rewarding the ones that are giving you the lowest rate and then you kind of get into that whole, uh, you know, taxi cab sort of environment where you're just sort of... Uh, you know, offering the person with the lowest rewards, the, the the benefits, which are ends up being the lowest reward. Then you then there's an issue that the payment processing space kind of turns into like the airline space where all the sort of products are similar, but uh, the real reward is the end consumer. Um, I'm not a believer that this is going to happen because obviously innovation is going to continue, continue to happen. People think that the checkout is completely finished. I don't think it is. I think there's a ton of room to go and a ton of uh, growth to still be had. But it is probably the biggest bear thesis across the board for all three companies. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, like Tevis, what do you think? Like, like, do you have any interest at this price right now at $60, almost 60, uh, I mean, 61.19 right now is what it finished at. Yeah. I mean, look, I think PayPal is, is not a company that, um, I want to be holding over the long term because it doesn't mesh with, like, I understand the buybacks and I understand that, you know, it can be a cash cow and, and whatnot, but I think that I'd rather, invest in smaller companies that have higher growth. So similar to like SoFi's, for example, that even if they're not profitable yet, they have the potential to later on down the line. And, oh, I don't know what happened to my camera. If you guys oh, you're that. good. Um, but I, I am interested in buying PayPal simply for the fact that it is a good turnaround play for me for the next two years or so. Uh, because if and when it goes back into the triple digit range, then all of a sudden, like that's a really good payout for that amount of time. Yeah. So Tevis, I'm in the same boat. Like this is not a five or 10 year investment for me. This is something where I am saying I'm willing to lose X amount on the money I'm putting into it. If it hits a certain number, I'm going to sell. If it, unless, let me phrase that. If, news comes out to make it go down to a certain number I would sell. But if it goes down for no reason, just because it continues to go down and I didn't call the bottom, I'll dollar cost average into it. But I'm looking at this. This is not a Palantir to me. This is not a SoFi where I'm 
saying, I'm in this for five or 10 years, come yeah. hell or high water, unless management does something to really make me change my investment thesis. I'm in this for a week, six months, a year, maybe a year and a half. Once it gets to 100 to 120, 125, I'm not sticking around. Like this is one of those opportunities where I'm going to be like Chris, Chris, like this is something where I think really is tremendously undervalued. And I think it would still be a no brainer around that 90 or hundred dollar price target. And at that point I'll probably sell cover calls. Like once it gets to 80, if it gets to 80, I'll start selling cover calls on half my position. And then after it goes up to 100 or start selling cover calls on the other half or the whole position if the other half didn't get called away. And then eventually I'll be out. I, I, I'm i hearing exactly what you're saying, and I, I agree 100%. I, I think $100, $110, and I'm out. I think that that's a great trade. I don't know why everyone needs a triple, but Tevis's wow. camera right now is on a whole other level. I don't know what's going on, but it's okay. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I think, um, you know, a, a big metric that I like, and hopefully Tevis agrees with me here. He's a big Peter Lynch fan, the peg ratio. All right. The, the golden metric for the growth investor, uh, under one times is a great metric. Um, I'd love for you to search for some companies with peg ratios that can compete with PayPal's. What's PayPal's? 0.55. Jesus. You know, uh, Tesla, a large position probably for the majority of people listening, just as retail investors, it's definitely a re uh, retail golden uh, position, is 2.59. Okay, so that's nearly 5x what PayPal's is. And that, just so everyone's aware, you're, you're going to say, oh, well, pay or Tesla is, is growing faster than PayPal. No, the peg ratio is beautiful because it includes the growth ratios. So it's supposed to sort of take that uh, price to earnings ratio across what the growth is expected to be over the next five years. Okay. So taking the growth ratio for PayPal, also including on the price to, uh, price to earnings ratio, is supposed to be five times less than what Tesla will be. And think about what the news cycle could be like when the new guy comes in after a quarter or two if he's doing a good job and if he's really changing this, think about the upgrade cycle that's going to come and think about what the narrative is going to be. Like this could catch fire. There's a, to me, there's a lot more catalysts than negatives on this and that they also have the cash to back it up. And that's why I'm going, like this is not something I would normally do, but this is something where I'm willing to throw some money behind it because it's an opportunity that I think has, a pretty good percentage of making money on in the short term. Yeah, I feel like I said, did I say 40% gain? Because I was super wrong. I, I'm just realizing that. You sorry. You did not say 40%. You didn't give a percentage. Okay. Okay. It would have, sorry, I was thinking as a decline. Um, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're talking 80 to 120%. Yeah. Sorry. Depending on the numbers we threw out. So, like, um, okay. So, if we, so, so Steve, this is what I, I sort of want to understand. If, if we're both on the same camp where it's a short-term play and we both have 80 to 120% as our target. Me too. Okay. okay, all three of us. Um, 80 to 120%, we want to be in and out in two years. Then what's the benefit of just shares over leaps? Is it just the reduced fault, like risk involved? I mean, I don't like buying options. I like selling options. So to me, I don't want to hold naked calls for the simple fact that if it doesn't work out, I'm out the entire money. Like if this doesn't work out in the next year and it stays at 65, I didn't lose any money. I can just sell my position. Like right. you can make a lot of money on leaps if they work out, but I don't have a crystal ball and I don't need to play that game. Like, Maybe I'll buy one just for the hell of it, but I don't know. It's not something I do. I'd rather just freaking hold the shares, sell cover calls, and make make money that way. And if it doesn't work out, just get out and do something else. Yeah. Um, 
So we're about to hit an hour. Um, there's obviously other things that we could cover, small niche uh, things within uh, PayPal's business, like the fact that their operating expenses are getting cut like crazy and sales and marketing is down like nearly 30% year over year, stuff like Tim, that. I got, I got a question for you. Since you're going to know this more than me, is the new CEO tied to any RSUs? Uh, not that I know. They really haven't. They haven't disclosed anything yet. Is that's going to be a very interesting thing if this guy's coming in and he has performance metrics to get yep. paid out? That's going to be very big. Well, a couple things that we have to remember, right? He was part of the fastest growing segment in Intuit for the past like however many years, like. I don't think he would be happy running this as a slow ship. I think he's going to get right to innovating. And by the way, PayPal is innovating on new products at the fastest rate that they've ever done. And also on the same breath that I'm saying that is also the cheapest price that you can buy PayPal at ever right now. And and so aside from it being at $58 a little bit ago, I mean, it's, it's in the ballpark. And because I got confused or... A couple of people who were confused in the comments saying, well, no, it was $57 back in 2017. I'm talking as a multiple, uh, you know, to how much they've earned versus uh, revenue versus every single metric, whether it's price of sales, price of earnings. It is the cheapest the stock has ever been because those have those uh, numbers have grown so much since 2017. Anyway, um, any other things that you guys want to say before we close this out? Steven? Yeah, don't buy PayPal because I'm buying PayPal. Do your own research. But if you're using this as supporting material, I, look, I, I think that there. Are, if you look at the numbers, there are not many companies that are going to reflect the sell-off PayPal has gone through for the profitability it has and the balance sheet it has. I mean, Meta is the only other one Meta was a bigger company. Meta was generating a lot more profitability. They had more cash on hand. But they were a very similar situation. Show me another company that's done that. I mean, I can't think of one. Yeah. Especially with no leverage. So crop crossroads uh in the chat who's done a ton of great PayPal due diligence is saying that Alex Chris's compensation is almost all. Uh, RSUs, he says uh, he'll be the worst paid CEO if the stock doesn't do well. 1.25 million salary. Amazing. I mean, Noto makes something like that, 1.4 million. Yeah, but Noto also has like 300 million in terms of like performance. Yep. Almost yeah, all I mean, of the salaries in good. RSUs. Where did you find this crossroads? Please send that to me. I'd love to know. Yeah, seriously, your camera is is super annoying. Um, okay, so it's literally overheating. I touched it and like burned my hand. It's off. It's um, if it com combusts in the next seconds, like I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, I'm gonna quickly say also though, what is also funny is that institutions uh, still own the large majority of this stock, seventy six percent. They are not shorting this stock at only one point five nine percent. Anything under two percent is considered like zero okay um some of the greatest that, peg ratios point. that we're seeing and still holding up great growths across venmo across braintree and core paypal is still all growing i don't see the uh the bear case nearly as much as some do just because a competitor like apple pay is growing faster than we are does not mean that both can't coexist yeah this is not a short attack tevis i agree all right, from um, uh, from Tanner, around. Steve, and Tevis, the uh, the glasses crew. This is the glasses weekly, uh, and, and the Pokemon Mafia. All right, ne next week I'm going to have something to show you. Perfect, okay. perfect. I like that. We we are going to start a new podcast, Alternative Asset Weekly. Oh boy, I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not <laughs> like gold Pokemon. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thanks, y'all. Later.